In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed are the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. <coughs> Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your Spirit, and it shall be created. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the same Spirit may be truly wise, never rejoice in his consolation, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lady Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. Father Bruno Lanteri, pray for us. St. Bonaventure, pray for us. St. Ignatius, pray for us. St. Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, good evening. As the mellifluous doctor, whose name is Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, said, A Maria nunca satis. That's Latin. For in English, we can never say too much about Mary. So, uh, in the limited time that I, I have always in my, in my lectures, I always have to choose what I feel um, God wants you to hear. So I try to discern what, what is most important because there's always so much that can be said on Mary. So I try to choose what I feel was most important for you to hear. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is uh, a follow-up to what I started, I said I started two weeks ago. So two weeks ago, I introduced you to what are called the Marian dogmas. So I didn't, um, I didn't do justice to that, so I'd like to do as much as I can uh, today on that, as well as, uh, if we have time, introduce you to the, the other Marian truths that they want to turn into the fifth dogma. And one of your facilitators asked me to um, give you a clarification as to what is a relationship to Mary related to the Trinity. So I think I'll start off with that and we'll see how far we get. Okay. All right. Um, it's going to be a little bit heady, but I'll try to be as simple as possible. This is, this is basic theology, Christology, and Mariology. I think it's good for you to learn these, these Greek words. Okay? Uh, I'll give them to you and I'll explain them quickly. Latria, Hyperdulia, Protodulia, and Dulia. Okay, I'll say them again. It wouldn't be a bad idea if you could memorize these words. If you want to, you want to defend Mary, this is more, this is uh, Mariology and apologetics. Uh, this is not a course in apologetics, but we try to cover as much as we can. Okay, the, the word latria means this, adoration. The latriatic cult, if you are a theologian, that's the way we speak, no? But um, in common jargon, latria means we adore only God, okay? We adore the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Then we have what is called hyperdulia. Dulia means veneration. So we give the highest veneration to Mary, the mother of God.
So technically, we don't adore Mary. I personally feel we can't love Mary enough. And even one of the greatest writers on Mary, his name is St. Louis de Montfort. Some of you have probably heard of True Devotion. Have you? Have you? Yes. Okay, I made my consecration to Mary through True Devotion in 1976, a long time ago. And after that, I wanted to become a priest through, through that consecration. De Montfort says, Adorable Mary. Now, I'm not going to give you a course in English literature, but a little bit of English literature now. Okay? There is a difference between prose and poetry. Poetic expressions help us express what cannot be expressed in prose. In literature, because I studied literature before becoming a priest, you have what is called um, a literary expression where you actually ex exaggerate something to accentuate a point. So de Montfort, it's called hyperbole in English. Okay? He's using a hyperbolic expression when he's talking about Mary. When he says the adorable Mary, technically you should, you know, we don't adore Mary, but poets will use certain adjectives and expressions because they want to express what's in their heart, which goes beyond mere prose. So we say latria to God. We say hyperdelia to Mary because we give her the highest veneration. But we don't adore Mary. Even de Montfort says in the number one of true devotion, Mary is a mere creature. And if you know your Aristotelian philosophy, Mary is a contingent being. Which Mary means, which means contingency that Mary depends on God. Okay, below that you have what is called high, you have protodelia. I would be almost shocked if you knew what that is, but that's the first devotion you give to St. Joseph. So St. Joseph is in a class by himself. Then you have Dulia, which is with the uh, veneration we give to the saints. Okay, you hear it? did you understand? Now, it's a little bit heady, but I think if you could learn, you could learn those four Greek words, it's a good apologetical tool to be able to defend. Because what, what do the Jehovah Witnesses and the Protestants say? They say that we adore Mary, right? We got statues, we're adoring Mary. You have to know how to defend Mary. So you use those four words and say, look, we've got, we adore God, we have the highest veneration to Mary, and we venerate St. Joseph, number one, and then the saints come along. That's good Mariology, that's good Christology. But I said, following in the footsteps of, of, Col of Col Colby as well as St. Louis de Montfort, we can't love Mary enough. And some people say, well, I'm talking more to Mary than Jesus in my meditation. It's fine. Think Jesus is going to get angry? No, oh, come on. You can't get angry. Jesus is happy if you talk to his mother. Like if I'm at a table having a meal with you, and my mother is there, and you're, sp you're spending more time talking with my mother, I'm happy with that. I'm not jealous. <laughs> Mary doesn't suffer from original sin concupiscence. Mary doesn't get jealous, or, or Jesus doesn't either. So we really can't love Mary enough. And the more we love Mary, the more we love Jesus. Amen? Amen? The more we love Jesus, the more we love God the Father. 
The more we love God the Father, the more we love the Trinity. It's a ladder. And St. Louis de Montfort goes so, so far to say that he who does not have Mary as mother does not have God as father. Wow. <laughs> That's St. Louis de Montfort. Strong words, huh? That means you're a spiritually illegitimate child. <laughs> so having Mary as mother means we're going to have God as father. And Jesus as our older brother. Okay. Okay, so let's go back to the Marian dogmas. Okay, they are, there are four, and there's possibly a fifth on the way. The Marian dogmas are the Immaculate Conception, Mary's Perpetual Virginity, Mary's Divine Maternity, and Mary's Assumption into Heaven in Body and Soul. Those are the four Marian dogmatic statements. Therefore, to deny one of those, you're not a Catholic. So I think we should know that know those these dogmas and be proud of them, as well as to be sufficiently literate to be able to explain them. If you really love Mary, if someone asks you. Tell me about Mary. Uh, you should be able to go through the mysteries of the rosary with great eloquence, I hope. Otherwise, I'm cast into desolation. <laughs> I mean, my book hasn't hit, hit home. <laughs> but then you should, you should be um, articulate enough to be able to explain the Marian dogmas. So the Immaculate Conception. Brief summary. The Immaculate Conception was proclaimed in the year 1854 by a pope whose name was Pope Pius IX. Ineffabilis Deus would be the papal bull that you can download, which isn't too long. The papal bull means where the Holy Father proclaims it dogmatically, and you've got a theological statement, ineffabilis Deus, which means God is ineffable through Mary's Immaculate Conception. Okay, the, the meaning of it is this. And I said that two weeks ago, if you do not understand the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, you cannot understand, you do not understand the dogma of, I'm sorry, original sin, you cannot understand the Immaculate Conception. It's impossible. Okay, so original sin was the sin of Adam and Eve that we read in Genesis chapter 3. they committed the first sin in this world. The first sin was the sin of the angels. But the first sin in this world was the sin committed by Adam and Eve. And that became what is called a moral tsunami. A moral tsunami means that that sin has moral repercussions until the end of time that we are all affected by what Adam and Eve did. That we are all conceived and born in original sin. Whereas God, in his infinite providence, decided to choose one of the human race, race to be preserved from that, and that was Mary. So it happened 
And I really believe that Saint Anne is an underestimated saint. I repeat, I really believe Saint Anne and Saint Joachim, they're really underestimated. Because in the womb of Saint Anne took place the Immaculate Conception. Wow. There should be a veneration of the womb of Saint Anne. I've never heard that before, but there should be. That makes all wombs of pregnant women blessed. Amen? Amen. It does. The dignity of the woman. Yes. And Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, says that the Immaculate Conception, he uses the word in Latin, conveniencia, or in English, it was convenient. In common American jargon, that would be, it's logical. Because we said the word convenient, we think of a convenience store, 7-Eleven, no? Um, but it, it, it's logical. Why? Because the Immaculate Conception, if we don't have the Immaculate Conception, that means that Jesus would have come into the world with his divine nature, perfect, but his human nature would be tainted by sin. And as Aquinas says, that's an abomination, just to think about it. So Jesus is half holy and half a sinner. I mean, that's... That, that it, it's, it's repulsive to think about that, isn't it? I mean, it's logical. That, that couldn't be. Jesus can't be half sinner and half, half holy. No, that's not. Jesus is the essence of holiness. So he had to come through a most pure channel, and that was through the Immaculate One, and it started with Immaculate Conception. So we celebrate, the, the beauty is this, that you're making your consecration to Mary on the Immaculate Conception. What a beautiful day. What a privilege, no? Really, I don't think you could have chosen a better day in the whole year. Just that you're aware of that the patroness of the Americas is Our Lady Guadalupe. But the patroness of the United States is the Immaculate Conception. Did you know that? I think maybe I told you that. She's our patroness. So even more so, I mean, as I'm looking out here, half of you people are immigrants. No? Uh, but this is your country, right? So you should love your country. You came here, right, from Vietnam or... Mexico, Guatemala. We were all immigrants in a certain sense. But this is our country, and Mary is our patroness. So we should be proud that the patroness of this country is the Immaculate Conception. We should really love the Immaculate Conception and try to get to know, know it better. Amen? Amen? So a way in which we can honor that is by wearing the medal I mentioned. The medal is called the Miraculous Medal, but the technical name is, the, the medal is really is called, it's the Medal of the Immaculate Conception. That's the real name. But in time, there have been so many miracles that it has a second name, the Miraculous Medal. But when it was first coined with Catherine Labore, whose feast day was a couple of days ago, uh, it was, uh, the, mirac the, immac the Medal of the Immaculate Conception. Now, one of the fruits of devotion to the Immaculate Conception is this. If we love the Immaculate Conception, Mary's going to be sharing, sharing that with us to, to a limited degree, and we are going to be sending less. Amen? I repeat, if we really honor the Immaculate, the, 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 the Immaculate Conception, Mary shares that with us. Mary is very generous. We're going to be sinning much less. And mortal enemy number one is sin. Amen? Amen. 
That's our enemy. Our enemy is sin. New people have a certain literary, poetic flair. I like to quote Wordsworth, who was one of the most famous English poets. Now, Wordsworth was not a Catholic, he was a Protestant. And he says this, Fulton Sheen is always quoting this verse. He says, Mary is our tainted nature's solitary boast. I love that. Isn't that beautiful? Mary is our tainted natures. Maybe if you're struggling in English, it goes over your head, but it's really beautiful. Tainted natures means that we're, we are tainted with original sin. She's our only boast, that she didn't have it. So we're, we boast, we praise God for that great privilege that the Immaculata was given. A beautiful prayer is, from the middle, O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. There's a handful of people who speak Espanol. We say Ave Maria Purissima. Ave Maria Purissima. Ave Maria Purissima. So that's the ways in which the Spanish, especially the Mexicans, greet Our Lady. No? All right, there we have the Macca conception. Let's move on. Let's, uh, let's uh, explain the perpetual virginity. just like to share something they heard on Relevant Radio. Um, uh, Father Matthew Spencer's program, he has it at 4 o'clock. I really like, um, his program today was excellent, in which he, he encouraged people to consecrate themselves to Mary. And if you want 33 days, it would be starting today. It's January 1st. And he mentioned um, DeMond for mentioned Mike Gately's book. He didn't mention my book, though. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Why didn't you say your book today? What? We were waiting for him to say your book. Well, why didn't he say Maybe next book? time. <laughs> <laughs> but another thing he said is this. There's an article written by Janet Smith who probably gave the most eloquent talk against contraception in the past, maybe in the, in the history of this country. I invite all of you to try to get it. It's called Contraception, Why Not? She gave it probably about, maybe about 30 years ago. And she wrote an article saying there would be a very good idea to have a year a year of chastity for priests and bishops. I really like that. Now, that's the big problem today, right? Hello? I mean, priests and bishops, as well as you people, we all have to live it. No? But that's the big problem in the church today. And, um, I mean, he didn't explain the article in detail, but really what I think, I, haven't re I have to read the article. But set up, he said, uh, every Thursday, especially diocesan priests, come together and they pray, make a holy hour. They're able to go to confession with each other. And then they have a meal together. That's a great idea. That's a way in which you foster chastity, especially among diocesan priests. As we as religious, we live in a family. We're diocesan priests. They basically, they're, um, they're loners. No? And you, you, you're suffering a lot of loneliness. There's a lot of temptations. No? So they can come together 
once a week, at a holy hour, pray the rosary, and there may be, who knows, 20 priests. They can go to confession among each other, have a nice meal together, and talk, and have camaraderie, fraternity. Great idea. What do you think? Now that, of course, that has to go through the bishops. I think it's a great idea. And Father Matthew was an oblate of St. Joseph. He said, well, I'd like to do it even though I'm a religious priest. I like the idea too. So I, as an introduction to the Mary's Perpetual Virginity, uh, chastity is for all of us. There's marital chastity, there's, there's um, the vow of virginity of nuns, there's celibacy, celibacy for priests, there's widows that have to live. All of us have to live it. All of us. But in different states. And I really believe if we really want to live this, devotion to Mary is, is essential. You don't have devotion to Mary, you're going to have problems with chastity, I really believe. We have a really great love for Mary. Mary is your mother, this filial, tender devotion to Mary. You're talking to Mary. You're, you're opening up to her. Wherever you go, Mary's present to you. You confide to Mary. You tell Mary about your temptations, maybe even your struggles, maybe even your failures. Mary's going to keep you on that strict and narrow path. What do you think? Yes. Yes. Amen? Amen. Yes. I don't know if this is a California expression, but we New Yorkers say, behind every successful man, there's a woman. Maybe that's a New York proverb. I don't know. Is it? I don't know if they say that in the Vietnamese community or not. No, But it's, it, it, it's true. Behind me is the Blessed Mother. Okay? Yes. I'm not married, but the Blessed Mother is present. No? So this is the explanation of, and it's a dogma, Mary's perpetual virginity. Okay, Mary was virgin. You know what perpetual means? It means always. Always. The word perpetual means always, from beginning to end. Okay, there's a tax. Uh, there's a tax against this. Um, a week ago, uh, I, I work, I work uh, a lot with the Hispanics, a lot. Well, he's speaking more Spanish than English since I've arrived at L.A., no? My dad said, you're the only one I know who got a degree in English and you stopped speaking English, no? <laughs> And I started speaking Italian in Argentina. You know. And I came back from Rome and Argentina, and they put the adjectives in the wrong place, and I was kind of fumbling over English, you know. But um, is uh, Mary's virgin before the birth of Christ, during the birth, and after. What it's heading at is this. Um, on, uh, in Univision, which is one of the most well-known channels for, for Mexicans, Univision, uh, they have a documentary called Jesus. And it's a, it's a perverted presentation of Jesus and Mary. So some of you people are, are Hispanics and you're, or you deal with Hispanics, tell them that. And uh, Patrick Madrid, about two weeks ago, was very fir firm in saying, hey, they can't watch this. Because it presents Mary as having brothers and sisters, Mary uh, embracing and hugging St. Joseph in a sensual way, as well as Mary 
um, having other children. So, and Mary also, Mary, when she's bringing forth Jesus, there's a lot of pain involved. So you got, you got four or five errors right there. I didn't see it, but they told me that, and I was just saying, wrong, 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 wrong. Okay. My theolo theological mind kicked in high gear. Okay, first is this, understand this. Mary and Joseph, they were married. Mary loved Joseph and Joseph loved Mary. They had a very sublime, uh, a very sublime relationship. However, both of them, both Joseph and Mary, inspired by the Holy Spirit, they made a vow of perpetual virginity. You hear me? That was a vow. St. Joseph had the inspiration. Mary had the, had the inspiration. Okay? They were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, that wasn't too common in the time of Jesus. It wasn't too common at all. But they had already made that firm commitment. Which Mary wanted to give, Mary wanted to give her whole total being to God. Her mind, her memory, her emotions, her heart, her soul, her intentions, her body, she wanted to give it totally to God. And that entailed a vow of, of perpetual virginity. So I think you have to start with that, that, that inspiration that Mary had, that vow that Mary was inspired, and St. Joseph also. That that does not negate the fact that they loved each other. On the contrary, their love is way up here. And it teaches us that love is not simply a sensual and erotic love. Love has different levels. Very important for the modern society to understand that. Like your young people, everything is just, it's, 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 um, it's sensual. It's genital. It's erotic for the young people. I mean, that has its place in marriage, you know, the marital act, nothing wrong with it if you're married to church. That's how babies come into the world, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that, no? But there are different levels of love. I see all of you eventually might, might read C.S. Lewis, The Four Loves, okay? In which he's got the word for love, eros, philia, storge, agape. Philia, Philadelphia, brotherly love. Eros, an erotic love. Storge, the love between a mother and her child. And agape would be, the Latin would be caritas. In French, charité. In English, in Spanish, caridad. In English, we call it charity, supernatural love, charity. So Mary and Joseph had that. They had great love. But that love that they had was not tainted with any selfishness. We call it concupiscence. It was the most noble of loves. And it was a love, basically, of sacrifice. A love, John Paul II calls it, the mutual giving of self, where you're, you're, you're sacrificing yourself for the good of the other. Is that clear? This is a this is a vow that uh, it, 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 this is a dogma that a lot of people don't understand, and, and non-Catholics obviously they don't accept it. You speak of the Protestant or Jehovah Witness, but you know um, I was listening to a talk on Mary the other day, and um, I read read this and learned this many years ago, but. Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther, Martin Luther, 
the Augustinian priests, John Calvin, Zwingli, Melanchthon, you ever hear those names? They were all priests in the Protestant Reformation, and Henry VIII was not a priest, he was a king. Did you know that they all believed in the perpetual virginity of Mary? Very interesting. So this was, this was, was in the common teaching of the church years ago. Here, there were, here, here were the rebellions against the Catholic Church, but they defended that, that Marian dogma. So to understand this, you have to understand three different blocks of time. You're like three prepositions. Okay, you've got before, during, and after. I repeat, if you if, if, to understand this, you have to uh, you have to understand those those three those three words. Mary was virgin before the birth of Christ, during the birth of Christ, and after the birth of Christ. Let's just let's ex, let's explain that. Let's take before. Now this. The Protestants accept. At least most of them. You know why? It's biblical. The Protestants, everything is based on the Bible, even though they misinterpret a lot of passages, but at least they have that one right. <laughs> It was, your, it was your first meditation four weeks ago. The Annunciation. The Annunciation, you've got it there. The Archangel comes to Mary and says, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. You will conceive in your womb and bring forth a child. Mary says, how can this happen? How can this happen since I do not know man? Mary was saying, in that how can this happen since I don't know man, Mary was reaffirming her decision to be a perpetual virgin. That's why she responded that way. She didn't want to go back on her promise to God. Mary made a promise. She wanted to keep it. You make promises, you've got to keep it. You're married, you have a married a vow, you've got to be faithful to that. We've got to be faithful to our vows too. Mary teaches us the importance of being faithful to our promises. Not to be an Indian giver, you know? You be faithful to your promises. So how is this going to happen, Mary says? It's not like the doubting of Zechariah who was struck mute, right? Mary wanted to know, have clarity, She's going to have a child. How can she be faithful to promise and have a child at the same time? Mary's intelligent. And what does God say through the Archangel Gabriel? The Shekinah. Okay? Shekinah is the Hebrew for the overshadow. It says that you will be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. And that which is conceived in you is from the Holy Spirit. And his name is Jesus. Why? Because Jesus means right after he will save the people from their sins. So the name of Jesus indicates the very essence of why he came. Our friend Fulton Sheen says the most important title for Jesus is Savior. He came to save us from sin. And then the angel says, Behold, your cousin, who is considered sterile, is already in her sixth month. Why? Because nothing is impossible with God. Mary gives her fiat, 
her consent. She says, Behold, I am the hand, may the Lord be done to me according to thy word. Then you have, in that moment, the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. And Mary conceives by the Holy Spirit. And we're reading the prologue of John, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That we pray in the Angelus. We pray the Angelus every day, right? You know, in the Philippines, they say the Angelus every day at 12 noon. They stop everything. You know that? If you go to the malls, or you're in a dental office, or you're in talking with a lawyer, they stop everything to pray the Angelus at 12 noon. Any Filipinos here? Hmm? Yeah. Isn't that true? Yeah. It's beautiful, isn't it? So I think we should maybe go to Macy's and Nordstrom and <laughs> Food for Less and uh, let's try to implement that. What do you think? Good idea? So I'll, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll charge you with that mission, okay? Wouldn't be a bad idea. Okay, so there's, there is before. How about during? Okay, that, 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 uh, that, that movie in Spanish, which is actually made in Brazil, shows Mary, maybe some of you have seen uh, Franco Zeffirelli's also, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, almost all the Protestant films, when they show the birth of Jesus, what do they show? Mary in labor, but Mary is suffering. And she's bringing forth Jesus with a lot of pain. Any mothers here? Yeah. Were you in pain? Or was that just a figment of your imagination? <laughs> you were just imagining it, huh? No. Uh, uh, you mothers, you, you suffered a lot. Because you were conceived with original sin. Therefore, the consequence of original sin for the woman is to bring forth children in pain. And the man to earn the bread by the sweat of his brow. Ergo, therefore, the fact that Mary, Jesus, Mary did not have original sin she did not have to suffer the pain of childbirth. And she did not lose her virginity in the moment of Jesus being born. That's part of that dogma. Okay, I'll give you two images that were taught us when we studied Mariology. I'll give you, I'll give you, the first one is pretty good, the second one is just marvelous. One image they gave is this. Okay, do you remember uh, Easter, when the, Easter in the evening the apostles were in the upper room? Who came to visit them? So Jesus walked right through the wall. He didn't knock down the wall, didn't break the wall. That's one image that the fathers of the church give. But the best is this one. I love this image. Okay, uh, we had rain today. Imagine tomorrow at 12 noon, you're at home, and you have your, the, the, the curtains of your window drawn. And it's a sunny day at 12 noon. Okay, the sun comes into the room and it fills the room with light. Okay, did the sun that filled your room with light, did it break the window? No. Is it going to break the window? But is your room filled with light? 
in abundance? That's how the fathers of the church explain it. As the sun goes through the window pane, without breaking the window pane, so Jesus came out of Mary like light without Mary losing her virginity. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. yeah. Try to remember that. Great image. No? Sun at midday going right through the window and just filling the room with light. Jesus, the Son of God, the light of the world, came forth from Mary, and there he was in her arms. Mary singing a little lullaby to her little baby in her arms. So before, during. How about after? How about after? You know the most common objection. You've heard it many times, probably. Remember the passage? Jesus is preaching. He's busy in his public ministry. And someone from the crowd says, you know what it is. Uh, Lord, your mother, your brother, and your sister are outside and they're waiting for you. Well, the Protestants say, aha, gotcha there, gotcha, gotcha. I gotcha. Aha, uh-huh, Mary wasn't virgin. She had other children. But you have to read the whole text. What does Jesus say? Uh, you don't remember the rest of the text? Well, I'll tell you. Jesus says, who is my mother, my brother, my sister, whoever does the will of God is my mother, my brother, and my sister. What Jesus was saying is, yes, Mary has other brothers and sisters, but on the spiritual realm. And where is that going to come to full fruition? To other places. You're going to be meditating upon it this week. You're going to find it in John chapter 19 and then Acts chapter 2. John chapter 19, verse 5, what do you have? Jesus is hanging on the cross and he says, and he looks down below and he sees the two people he loved most in this world. It was the Blessed Virgin Mary and it was St. John the Evangelist. And he said, Woman, behold thy son, Son, behold thy mother. And from that moment, the beloved disciple took Mary into his home. There we have what is called Mary's spiritual maternity. Mary's maternity, her spiritual maternity. So Mary did not have other children on a biological plane, but Mary had, has and will have a multitude of spiritual children until the end of time, among which are you people here. Amen? Amen. You are the fruits of Mary's spiritual love. You are. When Jesus said, woman, behold thy son, son, behold the mother, he was thinking about all of you in that moment. He had you in, your, in his mind. He's, he's God, don't forget. He had all of you in his mind 2,000 years ago. And one, other, one other point is this. I can say, mi hermano Gerardo. I can say, mi hermanita Raquel. I can say that. Why? I can say that they're my brother and my sister. No, oh, we were born in Mexico, you were born in Michi- Michigan, huh? <laughs> True, maybe you're born in Michoacan, I was born in Michigan, okay? <laughs> we're not of the same biological origin, but we are the same in the sense that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. 
God is our father. Jesus is our brother. Raquel and Gerardo are my brothers and sisters and Jesus and Mary. Amen? Amen. That's true. Yes. Now I can say beginning Mass, my brothers and sisters in Christ, to prepare worthily for these sacred mysteries, let us, let us call it the minor sins. None of you came up and said, why did you call me my brother? You're not my brother. None of you fought with me on that when I started the Mass, did you? You didn't put up your dukes, no? Because we are brothers and sisters. So it's important. You have, to, you have to be able to defend this privilege of Mary in that way. Mary is our spiritual mother. And Mary did not have other children except Jesus. Jesus is the only. He's the first, the last, and the only. So I'd like to give you a practical application to this Marian dogma. If we honor Mary's perpetual virginity, we try to go deeper into it, then Mary is going to give us greater love for the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And Mary is also she's going to be giving us greater purity. She will. Mary is going to give, give that, that virtue to us. She'll communicate to us purity of our eyes, purity in our mind, purity in our thoughts, purity in our emotions, purity in our affections, purity in our desires, purity in our heart, purity in our bodies, that will be given to us through the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I'd like to close with a story. Over the past couple of years, one of my favorite saints is Saint Faustina Kowalska. Have any of you heard of her? Yes. She's the first saint to be canonized in the new millennium. She was actually canonized the same day that John Paul II instituted the Solemnity of Divine Mercy, April of the year 2000. And in my perseverance group I have on Friday night, 7.30, over the past year and a half, I'm explaining the diary, and I take one number and I spend a whole hour explaining it. I invite you to come if you'd like to come. Okay? It's going to take at least a couple more years for me to get through the diary, but I'm in no hurry. <laughs> I love that diary. It's my favorite book after the Bible now. I, just, I read it, it just gives me so many... So much light and consolation, insight. But related to the Blessed Virgin Mary, who Faustina loved very much. Her name is Santa Maria of the Eucharist, Kowalska. That's her technical religious name. So this would be the closing story. Is that she was praying and some of you have, who have your degree in mystical theology probably are, are aware that God speaks to us through what is called locutions and apparitions. Locution would be an interior voice that God's, God speaks to us interiorly. You have locutions, and so do I. God speaks to us within. But in her, in her life, God was sometimes appeared to her in external apparitions. That's why we have the Divine Mercy image. That wasn't, that wasn't an interior locution. That was an external apparition. Okay. So Jesus appeared to her. And he was dressed in a beautiful garment. And Jesus drew close to her and he took... 
his sash. It was a golden sash. And he placed that sash around her waist. And from that moment on, Faustina was given the gift of perpetual chastity, which he no longer had any bad thoughts or movement, movements of the flesh against chastity. What a grace. We can beg for that too. But we have to end with this point. Faustina said that she was begging the Blessed Virgin Mary for that for a long time. I repeat, she was begging the Blessed Virgin Mary for that gift for a long time. So for us to acquire virtue, we got to work on it, but we got to storm heaven. We got to pray and pray and pray and pray. Ask and you receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open to you. So that's one of the fruits that will be given by honoring Mary's perpetual virginity. That Mary wants to share with all of us, as well as your children, maybe they don't have that, that beautiful but very demanding virtue of purity. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. In this life, and for all eternity. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You can break up into your groups, and I'll be confessing up until about 9.30, 9.35, okay?